as a supplementary part of the lecture series. This is going to be a series of readings of a few romantic poems. As I have talked about in the lectures, the poets of this period, William Blake, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, John Keats, and others, were part of a romantic revolution against the uh, activities of the Industrial Revolution, and out of this romantic poetry came many of the sources of what would become modern individualism and parts of the creative, artistic notions that we have lived with ever since the Romantic period. First, I'm going to read a couple of poems from is William Blake. Blake, as mentioned in class, is the first of the Romantic poets, born in the 1760s, and he is particularly responsible for the way of thinking, the mythological or the ontological or structural way in which Romantics thought about the overturning of the previous worldview to which they had belonged. The first poem I'm going to read is a poem called London, and it's written so as to raise questions about urban life. It uh, mentions chartered streets, chartered streets that London had a charter, it was the charter that made the the city what it was, but chartered streets are streets that have been laid out in a grid pattern. And in the poem, he talks about the horrors of the contemporary city in which he lived. And this is how the poem goes. London by William Blake. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plague the marriage hearse. The second poem that I'm going to read is called The Tiger, and I have talked about it a little bit in class, if I remember correctly. And the tiger is Blake's way of talking about how what looks evil in the world may actually be not so much evil, but as a source of alternative energy, as a source of uh, an evil, that is no longer evil, that uh, receives its power from its rebellion against the powers of heaven that, let us say, created the forces in the first place. It's called the tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who make the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Perhaps the most famous of the romantic poets is William Wordsworth. And William Wordsworth wrote with his friend and colleague um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a series of poems called Lyrical Ballads. And in the Lyrical Ballads, Wordsworth brings forward perhaps the central theme for much romantic poetry, the idea of nature as a teacher, the idea of the experience of nature that Wordsworth had as a young boy and that other people who have gone out into nature and found themselves or found a vision in nature uh, as part of Wordsworth's um, poetic insight. This is a uh, chunk of a poem called Tintern Abbey, and in the poem, Wordsworth um, is praising 
the way in which the ways in which one looks at nature or goes out into wilderness, the experiences that one have has can can um, comfort you in other portions of your life, especially if you're stuck in the city. And uh, it goes like this. While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed no doubt from what I was when first I came upon these hills, when like a row I bounded o'er the mountains, by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by, to me was all in all. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite, a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm, by thought supplied, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. But not for this faint I, nor mourn, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed. For such loss I would believe abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart, and the soul of all my moral being. Another aspect of the Romantic movement was a, a fascination with magic, with fantasy, with um, adventure in the Orient, and so on. And one of the poets who's most famous for connecting to that was Wordsworth's friend, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And his most famous is the one that I'm going to read called Kubla Khan, or A Vision in a Fragment. It comes in part from uh, the readings that Coleridge had made in reading about Marco Polo, which we've talked about in class, and his trip to China in the 13th and 14th centuries. And um, out of that, uh, reporting by Polo um, and other adventure stories that Coleridge had read, he fashioned this poem. Uh, famously, he fashioned this poem while he was in an opiate dream, and uh, it was interrupted, so the saying goes, uh, at the end, uh, and so he never absolutely finished it. So it's kind of a fragment of a dream poem, and it goes like this. Kublai Khan or a vision in a dream. A fragment. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and here were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree, and here were forests ancient as the hills enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover, a savage place, as holy and enchanted as air beneath a waning moon was haunted by a woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced, amid whose swift half intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail, or chaffy grain beneath a thresher's flail. And mid these dancing rocks, at once and ever, it flung up momently the sacred river, five miles meandering with a mazy motion. Through wood and dale the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns 
measureless to man, and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult, Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves. It was a miracle of rare devoice, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abera. Could I revive within me her symphony and song, to such a deep delight twould win me that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware his flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. Last poem I'm going to read is a poem by John Keats, the, perhaps the most famous of the Romantic poets. It's a short poem about the poetry of the earth. It's called The Grasshopper and the Cricket. The poetry of earth is never dead. When all the birds are faint with the hot sun and hide in cooling trees, a voice will run from hedge to hedge about the new mown mead. And this is the grasshopper's. He takes the lead in summer luxury he has never done with his delights, for when tired out with fun, he rests at ease beneath some pleasant weed. The poetry of earth is ceasing never. On a lone winter evening, when the frost has wrought a silence from the stove there shrills, the cricket song in warmth increasing ever, and seems to one in drowsiness half lost, the grasshoppers among some grassy hills. You can find any of these poems in an anthology of romantic poetry. You can go online to Poetry Foundation. Virtually all these poems and many more are available uh, online. And uh, I would encourage you to read them, perhaps read them out loud, and indulge in romantic poetry.